Hello again everyone and a warm welcome to this week's Everton show. There's no Premier League action for us to reflect on this week of course, but there's still plenty to talk about. Ross has scored another goal and, and he showed what he's doing week in, week out for Everton and, and Phil Jagielka probably uh, a very special landmark who captained your country. I'm very proud that Everton and the community have, have led the way again. You know, breaking new ground, always breaking new ground. I'm very, very proud of what our club does. It was loud. It was in the tunnel. Yeah, it was the loudest game I played in. But I think uh, my adrenaline got me through it as well. When I said to Shades, I said, um, I wasn't happy about your work rate, you know, at Preston in the reserve game. He says, no, I'm a first team player. Is that what he said? <laughs> We had a great result against them last year at Goodison and um, like I said they've started fairly well but um, we're going along nicely and um, we're very confident going into the game. Look out for that fantastic big interview by the way in part three of this week's show. It was when Snods met Howard Kendall and I tell you what it could have filled a show of its own. Ian Snowden's alongside me this evening. International break snods. I don't like these international breaks. We've had too many for me so far. Yeah, we have, but it's nice to see England qualify uh, for the major tournament. But you're right, it's, uh, it's all about club football. We love watching Everton. We love being part of Everton. And uh, for us, that's what it's all about. So, yeah, it is a little distraction for us. There was some good news for Evertonians, though. Phil Jagielka became the very first Everton player to captain England from the start of a game, which is some going. Absolutely fantastic. He's been, he's been brilliant as a skipper uh, for Everton. I think the fans have really took to him. He's got respect in the dressing room. That's the main thing, uh, respect of all his fellow players. Uh, and it's great for him to get the armband, even if it is only once. Hopefully it might be again for England. But I think the, the proudest man would be his father and his family, obviously. But his father will be immensely proud when he captained England. I'll tell you what, this boy's... Family will be proud as well, Ross Barkley, because he looks an international player now. Tell you what, he's been outstanding the uh, the couple of games through the week, and uh, he's only going to get better and better. Not hope for hopefully for England, uh, but for Everton as well. And he's adding goals, isn't he, to his repertoire as well, both at uh, club and country level. Well, every international break brings a mixed bag of fortunes for Evertonians, and this one was no different. James McCarthy, Seamus Coleman, Aidan McGeady and Darren Gibson lived to fight another day via the Euro playoffs. There was heartbreak for Stephen Naismith in Scotland, but England just march on and on. It was a perfect 10 for Roy Hodgson's men, with Phil Jagielka and Ross Barkley, as we've said, playing starring roles. Indeed, the performances of our two England stars left Roberto Martinez a very proud man. It's one of those international breaks that you understand the quality that we have, and you always, you cannot stop keeping your, your fingers crossed to make sure that they come back fully fit and, 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 and ready to play the next game. Uh, Ross scored another goal and, and he showed what he's doing week in, week out for Everton. And, and Phil Jagielka probably uh, a very special landmark as a, as, a, as a professional to captain your country. It's a special moment when you do it and you're the first Everton player to do it in the history, to lead the team out. It's, it's quite special and I, I think is a fitting person to achieve that landmark in our football club and Phil Jagielka in the last 12 months has been uh, a, a very very good captain we all know that but I think his performances they, they've gone beyond being just a captain he's performed very consistently in a very very high level and he deserves that that moment he deserves that pride um, uh, that that leading the country brings and and I think uh, everyone at Everton we share that that those feelings when we saw Phil Jagielka performing in the manner they did as a captain for England. Snods, we were speaking there about Ross Barkley and how he's added goals to his repertoire. You've said in this week's match programme that you think Ross should be aiming for double figures, even at club level. And why not, Daz? Uh, he's an attacking midfield player. We've got some quality old in midfield players in McCarthy and Barry and Mo Bezic when he plays. So that gives the licence for Ross to get forward, get into the box. And we know he's got a great left foot, right foot. He's strong when he's running at uh, uh, the opposition defence, so why, why should not Russ get 10, 12 goals a season? That's what uh, we're expecting. I'm sure that's what he's expecting as well, and he will produce goals. That's what we expected from Sheeds and Trevor Stephen, wasn't it? Well, that's why they were so successful. They weren't just Sharp and Gray scoring goals, they were Stevens. Derek Mountfield, I think he got into double figures one season from centre-back. Mm. So surely Ross Barkley, the, the way he plays, He's got to be looking at double figures. Scored goals, goals good goals as well, doesn't he? Scores he? great goals. Every every goal, every Evertonian score are great goals. <laughs> but Ross does like a special one now and again. A few special.
special ones for England too from young Ross. Well, another plus to emerge from this recent bout of international fixtures was the return to match fitness of Seamus Coleman, who played for Ireland over in Poland. The right-back is now in contention for return against Manchester United this weekend, but in his absence, young Tyus Browning certainly hasn't let anybody down. He coped with one of the league's trickiest wingers at Swansea, then he dealt admirably with the cauldron atmosphere of a Merseyside derby. It was loud. It was, I did it in the tunnel. Uh, it was the loudest game I've played in. But I think uh, my adrenaline got me through it as well. So any nerves beforehand? or? Yeah, yeah, a couple of nerves. But I think that's only normal, being a derby. Yeah, but after I did enjoy the game after it anyway. Yeah, the few experienced heads like that, like Jags and whatnot, do they help you through it? Yeah, uh, especially playing next to Jags, it does help a lot. Um, he's always sort of here giving you advice and, and telling you what to do and what not to do. What's he like as a captain? You've obviously been a captain for the 21s. He's you know, captain, been here for a good few years now. He's a good role model on and off the pitch. And um, he, as you say, he's helped me through the, the last couple of games I've played in. You came back for pre-season a week early, didn't you? You volunteered to go with the 21s. Do you see this as reward now that it's paid off? I'd like to think so, but you know, I've been working for the last with the first team for the last two years and I think it will have to happen sooner or later and, and now is a good time. You made your debut, you made your first Premier League appearances last season. Was it a case of being patient after that? Yeah, yeah, um, I just had to keep waiting obviously you never know what can happen with, with injuries and, and suspensions and whatever but I'd like to think I've been quite patient. Has it helped having Brendan Galloway going through the same situation that you are at the same time? Yeah, I mean, um, He's he's done unbelievable. You know, even I'm on, when I'm on the sides watching him, I'm, I'm excited for him when I see him running down the line. But it's it's good to see. The manager said he sees Brendan as a centre half in the future. Is that the same for yourself? Yeah, I think so. I'd like to think so. Yeah, it's where I do feel more comfortable. But as a as a player, I'd love to be able to play in numerous positions. Smashing lad, isn't he, young Tyus Browning? Well, bringing young players through into the first team is very much the Everton way, but it's not just Tyus who has been to the fore this term. We spoke to under-21s coach David Unsworth about the other emerging talents, Brendan Galloway, and first of all, he spoke about Matty Pennington. Yeah, he's a, he's a great example of, of sort of, not a new pathway that we know, this club has always had the pathway, but you know what we believe uh, is a quicker pathway, really, uh, in terms of you know him working with the the under-21 group, um, us um, preparing him and, and, and getting him ready for, for a possible loan, um, you know, was arranging that loan and then him gradually working his way up from, from a loan move, at Tram which started off at Tranmere, did great at Tranmere, um, and then he came back and trained with us for a while, he kicked on, you could see that, you could see that in his performances for the 21s, then his loan move to Coventry. Uh, albeit for just a couple of months and then it was extended and extended again um, to him you know really kicking on in the summer doing pre-season with the first team um, and then him, you know it's no surprise to anybody who knows Matty that he got his, his opportunity this season um, we identified sort of uh, an area where we we didn't have as as many players certainly from the the, the sort of left centre back role, uh, we identified an area where you know it wouldn't block anybody else's pathway coming up from the 18s or, or the 21s, um, and you know with the recruitment department and everybody else who was involved, the coaches, you know we we looked at Brendan uh, a couple of times and, and straight away you could see that he was he was a talent. He you know he had he had great tools, he had great pace, very you know great on the ball. He came in, he spent a year. Um, in the under 21s where all he had to worry about was you know what football boots he was going to wear in the morning so we could just concentrate solely on his on his uh, his performances for the season in the 21s every morning every afternoon he, he put the hours in he worked his socks off and again another one who was ready given an opportunity and and he's, he's certainly taken it hasn't he he's um, you know, he makes me very proud every time I, you know, I sit in the stands and watch him every Saturday afternoon. It's it's great to see, and I'm delighted for him as well. He's a lovely lad, and he's uh, he's got a great family. So, you know, it's no coincidence that all these players who are coming through are, are great pros, very humble. Got, you know, got great people around them, and um, you know, the the great lads themselves. So that's no surprise. Snods, I love listening to this fellow. He's so passionate when he speaks about the development of young players. 
Delighted he's back at the club. Uh, great player for the club. I know he, he tried uh, his way down in London and Birmingham area, but his home is uh, Everton Football Club, and it's great to see him back. Great to see him working with talented young kids as well, and his enthusiasm surely will be, he'll be perfect for them boys because uh, he'll drive them to hopefully the first team. He's very much... Uh... Fixture down at Finch Farm, of course, now, Unzi. What I like about the layout at Finch Farm is that the lads like Tyus and Brendan, who have come in and done really well for the first team, they still get changed in the under-21 dressing room. They're, they're not quite ready to move into the first team dressing room. Is that the right thing to do? Rightly so, yeah. Um, they've got to earn the respect, the right to get in that first team dressing room. And just one or two performances and good performances don't get you in there. You've got to do it consistently. And then the boys will accept you in there and you become part of it. But uh, Tyus uh, is a shy lad. Uh, you can see he's laid back as well, but he's a talented player and Galloway has been absolutely outstanding since he came in as well. And it's just fantastic that we're giving, the, giving these kids opportunities to play in the first team. Roberto must be loving it, the, uh, the academy side of Everton Football Club. They have done fantastically well when called upon. Well, that's just about it for part one of this week's Everton show. Coming up after a short break, we'll hear from Teenage Academy product Anthony Evans and the Shadow Home Secretary Andy Burnham, an MP and a lifelong blue. Welcome back to part two of this week's Everton show. Before the break, we were speaking about the Everton way of bringing young players into the first team. Well, before that process can be implemented, we have to first nudge the boys into the under-21s from the under-18s. Anthony Evans is in the middle of that journey, and he recently signed his first professional contract. Childhood dream, it's all I wanted since I was a little kid, since I started playing football, and yeah, dream come true. Your 17th birthday a fortnight ago, and you're still a first year scholar. Yeah. Must be pleasing to get it done so early. Yeah, it was down to Unzi. He shown the faith in me to get me up to the 21s, and then I shown a bit of form, a bit of a bit of talent on that, and he's given me the faith and uh, give me, uh, rewarded me with a professional contract. Obviously, it's been a, a quick progress here with the 18s at the back end of last season. Little experience in the 21s as well. Yeah. How, how difficult has that been? The jump from the 18s to the 21s massive, like, and then going back down with the 18s and up to the 21s. It's like it is hard, but it's it's a good experience, good learning curve, and I'm thankful for it. You mentioned Unzi there. How much has he helped you throughout the process? He's, he's been great with me, do you know what I mean? He's, he's the one who's shown the faith to take me to Ireland because there's loads of quality players and he picked me, so I can only thank him for that and thank him for this moment, man. And obviously you've been around more senior players in recent months. How much have they helped you both on and off the field? They're like idols, aren't they? So once you're playing with them and that, you feel at ease because they're great players and playing with better players is easier for yourself, so it's good. You've been uh, since the age of nine in the Everton Academy, so it's a proud moment for the the coaching staff and the management as well. Yeah. Uh, what they had to say about it? Just all of them congratulated me for it and as, again I'm thankful to them because they've taught me what I know now, do you know what I mean? So yeah, it's good. Fantastic and for those who haven't seen you play, how do you des describe yourself on the pitch? I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes play nine, don't I? Sometimes play as a ten but quite quick. I can see a pass on that so hopefully I can uh, start scoring a bit more goals so they don't know what's coming. We um, mentioned David Unsworth in the under-21s there. Is he in the next game to get established in that side? Definitely, yeah. Definitely. So what are you looking for for the rest of this season? To get myself established, just get straight back up there and stay there permanently, get a few, as many games as possible. Anthony Evans has got an Ian Snowden 1980s style fringe there, hasn't he? He has, to be fair. Uh, he's got a little moustache going off <laughs> as well there uh, in that one. He does uh, look rather similar when I were his age. but uh, You've seen a lot of the boy, haven't you? I think he's more talented than I were at that age, to be fair. Uh, he's, a, he's a cracking player. Um, he says he describes himself either as a number nine or a number ten, but what I like about him, he can score goals, that's first and foremost, but he holds the ball up well. He's got a nasty little streak in him as well. You I like that. that. I, I do. I think it, I think it's fantastic when a player's got that that nasty little bit in him to uh, to look after himself on the pitch, and he's certainly got that. But first and foremost, he's a talented footballer. And the goal scoring knack is brilliant at that age because you can't really coach that, can you? You can't. He gets into great situations, great areas when the ball's coming into the box. But he also likes to pick it up and run at defenders as well. So I think he's got the all-round ability to score plenty of goals. I suppose a lot of young players, and you've been in and around young players all mm. your football life, will sign their first contract and then sit back and think, I've made it. 
Yeah, and that's one thing they can't do because we know it's, uh, it's the first step on the ladder, as they say, uh, scholar first, then a pro, and then hopefully go and establish yourself in Unzi's under 21 and then break through into the first team. He's got a long, long way to go, but he's listened so far. He's been at the club since he was nine years old, so he's doing something right, so long may it continue for him. And he knows full well that young players at Everton Football Club if they do the business, we'll get the opportunities. Well, he'll be looking at uh, the likes of Ledsons, the Walshers, etc., who are probably a year or two above him, but he's looking at them. They're on the fringes. There's no reason why this look can't be. The pathway to the first team is very much illuminated at Everton Football Club, and Roberto is never slow to give the young players a chance. In fact, Fitch Farm is certainly the perfect environment for young players to learn their trade and fulfil their dreams. The complex has been open now for eight years, believe it or not. How time flies. Alan Stubbs, Joseph Yobo, Joni and Lescott were in the squad then. And during the recent international break, we took the opportunity to show some of our loyal supporter club members around the facility. Over to you, Diamond. Go and have a good look round. There's pieces of history that have been made by teams up and down the years at this fantastic club of ours. But as we get to the top, we've got a blank space. And this is where Roberto is turning around to the players who are here now and saying, listen lads, here's all your history as you come up the stairs. You create your own bit of history and you get yourself up there and hopefully this year could be our year. We were invited by the club, 10 of us to come over through the Wakefield branch and we travel up and down the country every week. Season ticket holders we jumped at the chance to get down here. Basically, couldn't wait to get down here. It's amazing! It's absolutely superb. This place. It's well, it's everything I thought it was and more. It's absolutely fantastic. Not many people get a chance to see this for starters, and to come and see it, it's just it's a bit overwhelming, really, to see it. Our oh, game has been fantastic, and we, I mean, uh, we've met Dunk. Uh, a few of the first team players was in. Absolutely fantastic. Facilities are brilliant, second to none, aren't we? You know, we're bringing the best quality through, aren't we? You know what, young lads, Barclays and your Garbets and your Galloways and all this. New lads coming through all the time. Myself, Snods and Sharpie have all been round showing the various aspects of a phenomenal place here at Finch Farm with all its magnificent facilities and hopefully the supporters have gone away with a little bit more insight behind the scenes at Everton Football Club. Snodge, you showed a few supporter club members around Finch Farm as well. It's a terrific facility, isn't it? Absolutely fantastic. When I, when I signed for Everton, Belfield were kind of special then uh, to me. But then you, you see Finch Farm and you think, wow, you wouldn't want to leave uh, if you were a player. You'd, obviously, they have the breakfast there. Uh, there's loads to do after training, but the facilities for training is second to none. So uh, I, I would, if I were a player now, I would not leave that complex till late in the, late in the evening. What about all the coloured boots? Dear me, I tell you what, if, I, if I'd have wore coloured boots, I'm from a mining village in, in South Yorkshire, my dad was a miner, and if he saw me in a pair of yellow <laughs> or pink boots, believe me, I would get a clip round the ear to say the least. They're not even boots, are they? They're too light, they're like slippers. They are, aren't they? I can't, I can't believe that they complain that, but saying that, the ball's got even lighter from when we played, so imagine them boys kicking the balls in the 60s with them boots on. So. Uh, no, that's, I'm sorry, that's, it's fashion now. It's the way of selling boots and uh, the boys are marketing tools these days. They certainly are. And now for something completely different. Not many guests on the Everton show will be fully fledged, fully paid up members of the House of Parliament. But Andy Burnham is no ordinary MP in our eyes. He's a massive Evertonian who's never been shy of nailing his colours to the mast. He may have lost out to Jeremy Corbyn in the recent Labour leadership battle, but he never took his eye off the ball with regards to events at Goodison, both on the pitch and off the pitch with our work in the community. I'm very proud that Everton and the community have, have led the way again, you know, breaking new ground, always breaking new ground. I'm very, very proud of what our club does. It puts its values into practice and uh, uh, takes a lead. And, you know, this is the third such uh, day, Mental Health um, uh, Awareness Day. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a brilliant thing to be, uh, to be supporting on a, on a day like this. Last year, of course, you ran the marathon and for Everton in the community. Have you got any involvement plan for anything similar coming up yeah um thinking of doing it again next year you know said i vowed on the day i'd never do it again but you know it quickly 
kind of uh, gives way to a feeling of, oh, I could have done better on the day. And I feel I could. I was like four hours, 26 minutes. Uh, kind of felt I could have been closer to four hours, probably maybe just under. So, yeah, beginning to think about doing it again. And, of course, I'd love to do it for uh, Everton in the community uh, again. You know, it was a, a proud day to run around London with, uh, uh, with, with the Everton logo on my back and uh, uh, hopefully did something to raise awareness of, of what, our, uh, what our club does. It's been a busy few months for you, of course, Andy. Have you had a chance to get to many games so far this season? Not as many as I would like. Uh, with the leadership contest over now, I'm uh, uh, happily spending more time with my uh, season ticket. I um, was at the derby at the weekend and uh, got to Reading away, so beginning to get, get back uh, back in the swing. Playing OK, aren't they? I was just waiting for them to uh, you know, feel that the potential's all there. I'm just hoping that we might just go up a level. I've got my eye on that uh, League Cup this year. I think it's our... Our time to uh, get get that get a get a trophy back in the cabinet. So I'm uh, I'm I'm hopeful. I think you know uh, uh, Roberto's definitely uh, kicked on this year with the, the, the squad. Uh, so much potential there. Uh, a lot of a lot of them playing well. It's just if we can now kind of knit it all together to uh, you know have a go at uh, uh, some honours this year. I've got a lot of time for him, Andy Burnham. It must be difficult if you're an MP. You need the support of as many people in the city as you can. But he's not afraid to nail his Everton colours to the mast, is he? No, he's a true Evertonian, isn't he? I've, I've met him on a couple of occasions. We've had him on the fan zone with us, and uh, he's a popular figure around uh, Goodison Park when he turns up, and uh, he certainly does uh, love the blues. There's no question about it. He knows his onions as well, doesn't he? He knows he does. what he's talking about. Yeah, he, he certainly does. Um, he's seen some good sides uh, while he's been sporting Everton. He's seen one or two bad ones, I would imagine, as well. But he certainly knows, uh, he knows a player. He knows the way that he likes to watch football and uh, yeah he is, he's, uh, he's a great fan. You were at this tournament that Andy's picked it at here, it was the uh, football tournament organised by Everton in the community for people with mental health issues and these lads, the coaches, put a right shift in, don't they? Fantastic, I turned up to do the prize giving at the end, uh, they'd been there all day from 11 o'clock, Johnny who was on the show last week, he'd organised it and uh, fantastic event and it doesn't surprise me because Everton in the community, whenever they put an event on, it is absolutely A1 and every every team that went there and let me tell you there was a lot of tough tackling teams in there Man City especially they got beat in the final but uh, everybody came up to Johnny at the end and said thank you very much well run we'll be here again hopefully next time you put one on it doesn't matter at what level you're playing for Everton Football Club once that crest is on mm. your shirt you're representing the football club mm, you are we had a couple of teams in it who really didn't do as well as they were expected they all wanted to win the win the coveted trophy by the way but uh, it weren't to be but you could see everybody that had put time and effort into that was was satisfied at the end that it had all run smoothly everybody had stayed till the end to applaud the winners and it was just a fantastic day they make us proud to be blue, don't they, Everton in the community? And the lads, the coaches there, like like Scott and Dave mm. and, and Andrew. They put hours in. Every event we turn up in, they've been there all day, basically. They do a fantastic job, and I take my hat off to them. They, they're, they're great for the club. Fantastic representatives, one and all, the lads and the lasses, of course, from Everton in the community. Well, that rounds off the second part of this week's show. Coming up after the break, we'll bring you our latest big interview. And this time, it's Snods putting the questions to the man who signed him from Leeds United way back, way back in 1987. <laughs> Welcome back to part three of The Everton Show. It's big interview time, and this week we've got Ian Snowden in the chair, no less, posing the questions. His special guest is none other than Howard Kendall, the man who splashed out a rather large sum of cash, an awful lot of cash, by the way, to bring Ian Snowden to Goodison 28 years ago. The pair are still great friends, and I think you'll enjoy this week's big interview. Here we are at Formby Old Golf Club, and I'm here to interview the most successful manager in Everton's history. The man who was responsible for bringing me to this great club, it is Howard Kendall. Good morning, boss. Good morning, sir. Just before we go into uh, your management, I want to start about your playing career because I've seen clips. Uh, you were a successful player. You were a, a very good player in my eyes. I, I don't want to jump the gun too much in because I, I know you had many games, but the three of you in midfield, that, that's all anybody talks about. When I, when I signed for the club, it was... Even me, even my dad, when I, when I was coming for talks, went, Paul, Kendall and Harvey, he said they were sensational players. He said, you've got something to live up to there because the Evertonians will expect you as a midfield player to be as good as them three. What a midfield three you were. 
Brian Bone used to say, we, we were the only three-man team that won the, <laughs> won the league. Uh, like, well, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was just headlines every week. Mm. And, uh, I mean, after we played um, Los Tres Magnificos and things like that. <laughs> like, you know. What, what um, were the strengths? But, said, but it, it was a great team. Yeah, oh, fantastic It was a great team. team. It wasn't just the three of us. Mm. No, it was a fantastic team. But what were the strengths of your three individual strengths? Yeah, I, I think Cullen was a gifted player. I uh, had Johnny Morrissey outside him. I worked the right hand side. I was more of a defensive player than Colin, but Paulie, Paulie did the lot. I mean, he he covered a, a lot of ground, scored a lot of goals, um, and for me, he was the best player I ever played with. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. That is some statement. Some statement. You I didn't play with you, did I? No, well, you didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> well, you did in training now and again. <laughs> all right. I've seen <laughs> enough in training to suggest you weren't. All right, all right, fair, all right fair enough. Did you obviously enjoyed management, but how did the how did the move come to Everton? Was it Blackburn who approached you and said, we've had an approach from Everton? How could you turn down Everton? No, no. You know, it, 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 it was just such, such a massive club and, and so many fun memories, you know, as a player. Did you find it hard at first? It was difficult at the start because, I mean, when we go back to Catrick with the balance and the team and whatever, and, and I, I, I looked at the Everton squad and there was about six centre halves, about eight centre midfield players, one left wing, mm. nobody on the right hand side. It was just so unbalanced. Mm. And, I, and I was remembered of the Magnificent mm. Seven or Magnificent Eight, wasn't it? That, yeah. That, that I did fair. sign when I exactly. went in there. Yeah. And they, they said we want changes. You know, my first signing was Neville Southall, so they can't say mm. anything about that because he became the best goalkeeper yeah. in the world yeah. for me. And he, you know, he was absolutely fantastic. How, how did Neville come about? It was funny, really, because um, I had a friend who had a pub in Landudno. That's a shock. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> friends all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he. Norman Jones, his name was, and he had the Neville pub in Landudno, right. believe it or not. And Neville Southall's dad used to drink in the pub. And he called me, I was at Blackburn at the time. All right, yeah. And he, and he, he called me and he said, um, there's a player playing for Winsford United, goalkeeper, he says, you must come and have a look at him. So I thought, yeah, all right. And went down there. He was absolutely magnificent. Yeah. He went to Bury for six thousand pounds. Now I, I didn't need a, a goalkeeper at Blackburn. They wouldn't they wouldn't let me sign another one. Mm. I had two senior goalkeepers. But when I went to Everton, I, I, I wanted to clear out certain uh, certain goalkeepers and thought, well, I'll, I'll go to Bury. I can honestly say that I don't remember Neville South or costing us a goal. Is that right? And that, that, that is true. That is true. Well, I know I, the ambassador Graham Stewart was an ambassador with me, and I have to travel in with him, unfortunately, every day. He reckons he were the best signing you've ever made, but surely Neville must be the best signing you've ever made. Is, is this live? <laughs> <laughs> Neville's got to be. Got to be. Without best. a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. When you talk about. Neville Southall signing. Mm. I think I've got to mention Kevin Sheedy on that one. Yeah, well, oh, without a doubt, I, a big, big mate of mine. Love him to death, Sheeds, and I, what a left foot. You know, I mean, he didn't get the chance at Liverpool. He was only playing League Cup matches, apparently, and you know, um, um, went to look at him at Preston in a reserve game with yeah. Colin, with yeah. Colin Harvey. And I, I was a little bit sceptical in terms of his work rate. <laughs> I used to tell him that every week. But did you? Yeah, why, why, why did he need no, to work? No, no, when he, he wouldn't take notice of you. <laughs> no, didn't exactly, take notice of me no, either. No, you're right. <laughs> so, uh, no, Colin, Colin says, let's, let's, let's go for him. Yeah. And, I, and when I said to Sheeds, I said, um, I wasn't happy about your work rate, you know, at Preston in the reserve game. He says, no, I'm a first team player. Is that what he said? <laughs> Fair enough. There's Fair a, enough. There's no, there's no. I said, well, you know, if I sign you, you're in the first team. Yeah. And all the boys that um, were there in 85 and all the fans talked to me about the game that the old lady, Goodison Park, absolutely rocked that night. Can't let you get away without telling me about what your thoughts were 
on that Bayern Munich Should game. I oh, I was going to tell you the name of the uh, the game. I was going to tell you that. No, I'm going to tell you that because yeah. obviously I knew what you were talking about. I knew about. my history. I had I to look at your history. Talking about. So come on, then give me give me that well, day. Was, that, was that it day. as good as everybody said? Oh, jeez, dearly me. Goodison was rocking, and we went one 0 down. Um, so at half time you do a team talk, and I mean. Think, things stand out on team talks, and it, but they were natural with me. I, I, I thought, well, it, it wasn't a case of people remembering what you'd said. It was a case of like, hey, we're going towards the Gladys Street end. You know, they'll suck it in. Yeah, yeah. Two, two from long throws. The, two, the, two, the you know, the, the first goal of the equaliser, mm. and, the, and the second, and the second one to, to go in front, and the third one, Trevor Stevens' goal. I mean, that was absolutely incredible. But Udo Latte comes down the touchline. Yeah. Kendall, <laughs> this is not football. <laughs> well, you can imagine the response from that from that, everybody yeah. standing <laughs> up. Yeah. Do one, mate. <laughs> oh, not <laughs> politely, two, two. Politely. But, uh, <laughs> I felt the fight, not the final for me, because I, I, I was just watching it as a, I was a Leeds player mm. at the time, but I remember watching the game, the final. And it was the most one-sided fight. Was it an anti? I'm not saying an anti-climax because it couldn't have been an anti-climax. No. You won the cup, but compared to that game, was the final anti-climax? I'd, I'd seen Rapid before, and I, and I couldn't tell the players how confident I was because, like, you, you, they, they may have gone out there with the, thinking, "Oh, it's, it's, it's an easy one after buying." Um, so I, di I didn't get into that, but I was so confident because we were so much better than them. Yeah. But, I mean, a little journalist came down to me. Uh, I, I was upstairs and then went downstairs to the dugout to be with the lads, we two nil up. And this little journalist comes up, Kendall, Kendall, what is it like to win European Cup Winners Cup? I went, well, um, then Crankle scored. I went, clear off. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sheedy went straight That's down right. and scored. Kevin Sheedy went straight down and scored. And I went, hey, come here, lad, sorry about that. <laughs> I'll talk to you now. <laughs> but I, I, I remember watching the game and then, as I said, seeing it again. The number of Evertonians. They, they only oh. seemed as though they were Evertonians in fantastic. the ground that yeah. Night. yeah, fantastic. Great atmosphere. What did you feel like when uh, they lifted that cup? Must have been proud. Well, proud, I, I, proud I think moments. when you... I think you always remember your first time that you picked something up, you know, um, which was the FA Cup. Yeah, that's right. In 84, um, so you, you remember that one and then of course winning a couple of leagues and then, but I mean the European one was special. Mm. You know. We went out the, socially the other, the other night to some, uh, some friend's 65th birthday and I saw Evertonian's boss, grown men coming over to you, kissing you, kissing your hand and saying thanks for the memories. That must. That, you must feel great inside when, when Evertonians are coming the up. Mrs. Didn't believe it was a fella. <laughs> <laughs> but it must be a great feeling when they, when grown men are coming up and saying thanks for the best oh, years yeah, of my life, yeah, yeah, the yeah. trophies you've won, yeah. the enjoyment you've given them. I mean, I mean, naturally, it's an age group. Um, I mean, youngsters, the, the 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 parents have got to tell the youngsters that those times. Mm. So there is a certain age group which really come up to you and um, they were delighted with what they'd seen and I'm, you know, proud of it. Can I just finish off by just saying thanks for getting me to Evan Football Club. Absolutely love the place. It was a bargain. No, it wasn't a bargain. You had to, hmm. it went at first. I didn't, I didn't really do myself justice at first. Progressed later on at right back and, and stuff like that. But I, I'd just like to thank you for bringing me to this club. Uh, it's a fantastic football club. Fantastic manager, and we could talk for hours, I'm sure, and probably off air we will talk for hours. Thank you very much. Look Christopher. forward to it. Thank you very much, Ian. All Thank the best you. to you. Thank you. Snod, what a lovely piece of film that was. I hope that was sparkling water in front of you. It was sparkling water in front of me, and uh, I think Howard were dying for a drink during that <laughs> as well. Uh, but uh, what a privilege. Uh, I was quite nervous, to be honest. Uh, it was one of my first interviews uh, for Evan TV, but 
he's a legend and he still is in my eyes. I still call him boss. Yeah. All the ex-players still call him boss because he's got that respect. <clears throat> I just think he's a fantastic fella. Still socialise with him now when I see him as well. And uh, yeah, I admire the man. And he's what, what a job he did for Everton Football Club. I don't think he gets the recognition that he thoroughly deserves. He built two cha championship winning sides, mm. the European Cup Winners' Cup, FA Cup, almost did the treble. That's when I'm in his company and, and I said it in the interview, I've seen grown men uh, in the 60s, the 50s, saying thank you very much to him. Honestly, because it's given him the greatest years watching Everton uh, around and he's just, just more, he just shakes around, thank you very much. He doesn't think he's done anything anything special. I think he knows he's built, he built a good football team but he also knows that the players did it on the pitch for him. Uh, his man management was absolutely fantastic. Players wanted to play for him. That's the biggest compliment absolute I can pay. Absolute legend, isn't he? Mm. Absolute legend. Well, that's enough nostalgia for this week. We'll take a short break now. And when we come back for the fourth and final part of this week's show, we'll start the countdown to one of the biggest Goodison games of the season. Everton versus Manchester United. <laughs> Welcome back to the fourth and final part of the Everton show. It's Manchester United at Goodison Park this weekend as the big games keep coming thick and fast. Nods, there's no doubt about it. It's been a punishing schedule for Everton. It has. Uh, the fixture list when, we, when they came out uh, looked quite strong. Um, I think a lot of people, not Evertonians, but a lot of the people thought we might struggle. But uh, we've played already, or after the Arsenal games, uh, the top seven that finished mm. in the league last season, we've played them all. And uh, I think we've done rather well. I think we've, we're playing well, playing with plenty of confidence. And uh, yeah, it has. It, they have been punishing games, but we've we we've, we've played really well, picked up some valuable points as well. And I'm happy with the start we've made. As you say, when you looked at the fixture list when it was first published in June, you you winced a little bit. But mm. it's the middle of October. We've only lost once. That was against Manchester City when they were on fire. You'd mm. have taken that. Yeah, Man City did play ever so well at our place as well. We matched them for the first 45 minutes, thought it was a terrific game. I thought we played quite well. Uh, but you're right, we've, uh, we've played some very difficult games. Southampton are now on a run, playing really well. We went down there and won convincingly 3-0. Down at Tottenham was an hard-fought point. Uh, we got a draw down there. So um, Saturday against Man United, I don't fear. We can beat them. Yeah, I don't fear Man United. Uh, I think they're a good side, but... They're not a great side. They haven't got the Beckhams, the Scholes, etc. Uh, so I think uh, Goodison again will be very noisy, very rowdy. And I think if the boys put on a good performance, we'll certainly beat Man United. I'm, I'm confident. Goodison Park will be rocking, no doubt about that. Well, Roberto Martinez has played Manchester United twice at Goodison Park as the manager of Everton, winning 2-0 two seasons ago and 3-0 last year. The Blues boss always welcomes the challenge the Old Trafford side will bring and is very much looking forward to locking horns with Louis van Gaal again on Saturday. Well, we all know, I think, this, this Manchester United side is starting to, to, to get a real understanding. Um, to get top of the league is, is not an easy feat to achieve in our, in our competition. They achieved that two weeks ago. We faced them no long ago at Goodison and I think you, you know the, the individual quality that they bring. And it's, it's one of one of those games again that you need every single percentage um, in your favour to be able to to compete against a, a very good side. I thought uh, Goodison Park in the last two home fixtures in the derby and, and against Chelsea was very important. And I feel in the same manner that on Saturday we can get the same atmosphere, the same energy is uh, is a, a big advantage that we can use in our performance. But we'll have to be a lot at our very best, as you would imagine, because we're facing a really strong team. And, and this fixture in particular has brought the best out of our team the last couple of years. Two fantastic wins. Well, uh, at home, yeah, and obviously at Old Trafford we were very disappointed in, in last last season when uh, we felt that we played a lot better and the, the, the defeat um, gave us two outstanding saves from David De Gea, stop us from getting a positive result. The, the season before we got a, a historic win. Uh, we've been performing really well, but in the same way I think it's fair to say that Manchester United, they've been, they've been adjusting to changes and, and they found now a real settled team that uh, they've been performing really, really well this season and clearly it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a, very, a very tight game. I don't, I don't see big differences into the, into going into, into the three o'clock kickoff. Yeah, is it nice to play a game of this calibre on a Saturday afternoon at three o'clock? It is, yeah, it makes, it makes a difference. Sometimes, you, obviously, you don't control 
the, the kick off time and with the with the TV commitments. But it'll be great to to have a normal three o'clock Saturday afternoon uh, game at Goodison with our fans. Um, again, it's another sellout crowd, and and we're really looking forward to to make sure that we show the best uh, possible image of of our football club and and perform. Um, really, really well against a very good side. Snods the gaffer there just mentioning Saturday afternoon, three o'clock. That's something you go on about <laughs> time and time again. We know no different as, as, as players in our time. It was always uh, Saturday at three o'clock and you prepared for that. So, But with the television now, the rights that they've got to Premier League football, uh, it's even going to be Friday night football as well, is it? The Premier League. And so it's... Uh, it's not the same, is it? No, it's not. I used to love the three o'clock. Saturday and uh, and for me that's what you that's what you aim for all week Saturday three o'clock kickoff uh, the fans love that but I'm sorry to say that uh, TV's got the rights and they can do what they want so uh, but no I'm looking forward to it Manchester United at the weekend let me talk to you about Wayne Rooney who seems to be making more positive headlines for his country mm. than he does for his club at the moment where's he at I don't know but I'd have him in my team. Uh, if he wants to come back to Everton, no, uh, Wayne, the road's open for you in my <laughs> eyes. Uh, I, I know he left years and years ago, but he's still, in my eyes, a fabulous player, uh, team player. He's not scoring as many goals for Man United. Hopefully, if he does play on uh, on Saturday, he's been injured, he missed a couple of games with England. But if he does play, I'm hoping he's rather quiet because he, he's not, since he left Everton, he's not been brilliant to, against Everton and long may it continue. Uh, but he's still a terrific player and uh, he's still one that I'd have in my team. Fits and starts, I think, is the best way to describe Marouane Fellaini's mm. Manchester United career. Great lad. Uh, got to know him out in China. I had, uh, had 10 days or so out with Mar Marouane uh, doing things for Everton out there. And he's a great lad. Uh, got a lot of time for him. I thought he did well at Everton after a, a really slow start. Um, people were questioning the transfer fee. But since then... When he went to Man United, uh, the time he had at Evan, I thought he was I thought he was terrific for us. I thought it caused a lot of, lot of problems. And the games he did actually play against Man United, he was outstanding. He was the best player for Evan on a couple of occasions. So it was no surprise that David Moyes took him there. But uh, I hope we can keep uh, Marouan if he plays, quiet. But I think it's all about Everton. I don't want to talk about Man United. I want to be positive about our club, our team on, that, on this particular day. And I think if we perform, we can beat Man United. Quite right, Snods. It's all about Everton. And there's no shortage of competition for places in this Everton team, particularly in the wide areas. And one of the players waiting patiently and working ever so hard for a regular starting berth is Aaron Lennon. The Blues winger has been around the Premier League long enough to know that nothing can ever be taken for granted. But he admits that he'd love to be in from the off in one of the campaign's biggest games on Saturday. Yeah, can't wait. It's always a great game. Um, we had a great result against them last year at Goodison. And um, I said they've started fairly well, but... Um, we're going along nicely and um, we're very confident going into the game. You mentioned that it was a 3 0 win. Is yeah. that possibly one of the best best team performances you've been you played uh, here at Everton so far? Uh, I think so, definitely. I think we started brightly. The tempo was great. Um, we got about them, and like I said, everything went our way. But like I said, uh, probably the best performance at Goodison for us that that day. Yeah. The Yorkshire lad brought up at Leeds. Yeah. I suppose games against Manchester United, they were always quite fierce. Yeah, they always have been. Like I said. Obviously, that's like me playing from Leeds, or even just watching the Leeds games from a young kid. It's always a massive game for them. So, but um, every game against Man United, the top side, um, is, is a, it's a great game to play in and be involved in. So, like I said, we'll look forward to it, and um, we'll be ready. We've had good results against them in the past couple of seasons. Is, yeah. Are they still the United of old? Um, I wouldn't say the United of old, but like I said, they've started fairly well this year, and they've still got great players, great individuals, and they're still a good side, and so. I said we won't be taking them lightly, but like I said, at the same time, we're still very confident going into the game. So, Nos, like yourself, Aaron Lennon, a former Leeds United player, Leeds United v Man United, now there's a game. Yeah, they are a bit tasty. Uh, I never played against uh, Man United when I was a Leeds player, but uh, yeah, they don't like each other for some apparent <laughs> reason. I think that goes into the 70s when the likes of Billy Bremner and Johnny Giles played, but uh, yeah, that is a tasty fixture, but uh, so is this one on Saturday. He's a handy player to have around, isn't he? I like him. I like him. I think he gives you, I think he gives you a lot going forward with his pace and directness. But I think he gives you a defensive side of him as well. Uh, I know talking to Seamus Coleman about him, he loves playing uh, in behind uh, Aaron because he does work hard and it allows Seamus to get on the outside and get crosses in because he knows that Aaron will fill in for him. 
It's a part of his game that we as Evertonians didn't really appreciate when he first joined the club on loan last season. Mm, we did. And I, I, was, uh, I was quite surprised to see his work rate because I just thought he had one dimension to his game, Aaron. I thought he was just busy going forward, getting to the byline and crossing balls. I didn't realise that he, he works ever so hard for the, for the team as well. So uh, I think he's been a great acquisition. Whoever plays in the wide areas, it's important to take the game to Manchester United. We've done it two years ago, we've done it last season and we beat them. Yeah, we did beat them and we beat them convincingly at times as well because we played uh, really well, pushed them back. And, and I think that's what, just look at Arsenal the other week, what they did to them in the first 20 minutes. The game was over because they were positive, they took the game to Man United and Man United could, couldn't deal with it. I'm not saying that we, we've got as much pace and directness as Arsenal, but we can certainly take the game, take it to them early as well, hopefully try and get that first goal and get them on the back foot. Roberto Martinez said to the press earlier this week that John Stones may well be there or thereabouts, but Ramiro Funes Mori would be a little bit disappointed, wouldn't he? Yeah, I think he will, because he played ever so well in the derby game, really, really well, and I was pleased for him, to be quite honest. Uh, he's a defender, isn't he? He is, an out-and-out -out defender. That's what he's classed as, that's what he's come as, a defender. And when it, when it needs clearing, he puts it into Rose Ed. It's as simple as that. Uh, but in John Stones, we've got a quality, quality player, international player. And I, I would feel sorry for Murray if John comes back in, but if I were picking my strongest 11 to beat Man United, John Stones would be in it. Well, whoever plays, it's certainly one to look forward to, isn't it? And that's us done here on the Everton Show for another week. We've had our first ever England captain. We're keeping our fingers crossed for our Irish boys and we're ready for when Spain meets Holland at Goodison on Saturday. Roberto Martinez against Louis van Gaal. My thanks to Snods for joining us this week and a big thank you to all of you, not just for tuning in tonight, but for all your continued kind words about the Everton Show. We hope you've enjoyed it again this week. We'll be back to do it all again in seven days.